take one. Hello and welcome to the Studio Rat podcast number two. Today the Studio Rat team will be discussing Korn's second album. The second album is called Life is Peachy. Great tour. Came out in um, 1996. It was released uh, October 1996, almost two Two years years later. later. It was recorded uh, in in 1994 and April and July 1996 at Mount uh, Indigo Ranch in Malibu Studio. Now, Richard had said something from from part one of this corn podcast about how when they came to Indigo Ranch, they brought their crappy cars. You know, um, I had either read or heard something in the past that um, after they got big, this, when they came back the second time, they had BMWs, and in the trunk it was full of Adidas gear. You know, free clothes, free shoes, free everything. Right. So, Skateboard. Yeah, that's the name. Of that's so wild. You souvenir stuff, sponsors. Um, you know, they had hit it big. Here, here was. Some guys from a small town in Central California that had really hit it. Bak- Bakersfield had a country <laughs> scene, didn't it? Pardon? Bakersfield had like a country scene or some sort of... Yeah, well, that's what Jonathan's spot. Okay. I'm, and once again, my memory is slightly fuzzy. I'm pretty sure it was Jonathan's father, but in his studio, it was a country studio. <laughs> Speaking of hits, so Corn has made it, but in 1996 they still don't top the charts, uh, and that's no surprise. Um, the top five albums of 1996 are Jagged Little Pill by Alanis Morissette, at number one. Great album. Yeah. Yep. Daydream by Mariah Carey is number two. Another good album. Falling Into You by Celine Dion is number three. Notice that it's women leading the pack. Yeah, totally. Top three. Uh, and also the Waiting to Exhale soundtrack, which was a film about women. And yeah, Whitney Houston. Whitney Houston. And I think, um, was Queen Latifah in that as well? Or? I don't know. I don't think I've ever actually seen it. Uh, number four was Waiting to Exhale. And number five was the score by the Fugees. So there you go. Had, of course, a there you go. female vocal. Yeah. Female dominated period. Yeah, they were. And, uh, here was corn singing about real life. Um, yeah, that, that was that was a good year for Alanis Morissette, though. Yeah, well, she sold like something crazy. She, her, and like Hootie and the Blowfish hey, were like the last two big ones to sell, like more than fifteen million albums or something crazy before it all that went away. I think it sold twenty-eight million. If I'm and once again, these are. Opinions rather than facts. <laughs> sold three hundred seventy billion <laughs> albums. Uh, exactly. <clears throat> Life is Peachy sold uh, 2.5 million copies according to Nielsen SoundScan in January 4th, 2013. So you're in Indigo Ranch, Richard, just trucking along, and you get a phone call or somebody says, Corn's coming back. Um, Ross had notified us that Corn was coming back, um, and he started the album off with Chuck. Uh, Johnson uh, and uh, me uh, sort of supervisory engineering as I did with almost every group that came through. But uh, somewhere during the album, uh, Chuck had some life situations that kept him from showing up to the sessions on time. And Ross uh, dumped him mid-album and had me mix the album. And I was just noticing, uh, although I rarely got credits, uh, uh, as did many people in those days, but on uh, all the All Music page uh, on the internet, I do get credit for mixing that album. Nice. Although Ross on the album itself took credit for mixing. Um, and usually what would happen is I would set up a mix that was 95% of the way there. Ross would come in, touch up a few things that he wanted changed, and uh, it was uh, my my career had already been made. I didn't 
need the credits. Ross felt he needed the mixing credits, I guess. And I don't begrudge him at all. He, he was the major influence uh, in both music and in my life at that point. And uh, it didn't uh, hurt, you know, anybody to, you know, credits were not really that important. Mm. But I see all music did give me credit for mixing. Nice. Did, um, did the recording process change for that record, or was it very similar? Well, it changed in that Chuck was not showing up as um, yeah, you reliably that. as um, he had previously. And for the most part, I would start a session. Oftentimes, uh, you know, it would be like, okay, today we're going to do the, uh, a guitar solo on such and such a song. And I would set up the sound. And um, four hours later, uh, Chuck would come in and take over the session. But as I had said earlier, I was no longer into doing 10 to 15 hour sessions. Right. Uh, I just didn't have the energy anymore. As you know, you know, as I was getting older, I uh, was very happy when Chuck would come in and take over. Mm -hmm. When it came time to mix. Uh, I, I was basically the only one there. Can you explain to the viewer and listening public how long does a, uh, on a, on a big major label uh, release, how long does it usually take to mix a track? A few days. A few days. So it's not, it's not done in an hour. It's not done in 12 hours. It's no, there's, there's a, right. a, a great joke about when uh, Princess uh, Di went to see the Beatles after they were knighted and she went into the to the studio the Beatles studio and she was fixated on the edge of the recording console there were some large louvers and it after they had played a song out in the, the recording room she said well what what are these holes in the side of the console for and uh, somebody with the, out skipping a beat said, "Well, that's where the record comes out." <laughs> and uh, you know, not not derogatorily, but just it was a, it was a funny answer to, yeah, yeah. to a serious question. Um, the record doesn't pop out after three minutes. Most people think that a band goes in, plays the song, uh, ten minutes later you have the record. Mm -hmm. But oftentimes it's months in the making and. Mixes can take anywhere from, you know, a few hours to weeks. Right. I remember mixing the singles for Neil Young's Trans album uh, with David Briggs, and I think we spent three weeks on one song. It, you know, it, it, it made it back <clears throat> because it was such a hit album, but, uh, you know, that's a, a lot of time and ed energy and money putting into mixing one song. I, yeah, I don't I don't even know if record companies would give that kind of a lot of Yeah, I don't think there's a whole lot of time to develop in the studio these days or even to stay on. Yeah. You, you know, if Pro Tools fixes everything, the band doesn't even have to play. <laughs> band uh, doesn't even have to be I'm there. Not saying just from a negative point of view, there have been some advances in that respect. But sure. yeah. there's also been the heart and soul of the music has been taken away because the bands don't have to be able to even play their own songs. Well, they can, they can fix every note. Yeah. They can pitch correct. They can line them, line up the time to a grid, uh, and uh, everything comes out seeming like it was perfectly uh, played when, in fact, ninety percent of it was d done in the digital domain in software. Yeah. Well, it, it, it's definitely, and, and artists, various artists that we all know and have been publicly and privately have been kind of called out on the fact that these tracks are way overproduced. And, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I remember the whole thing. Who was it? Ashley Simpson, I think it was. Um, uh, or maybe I have her last name on, on Saturday Night Live, where she was caught red-handed singing to us. Oh, lips, yeah, she was lip-syncing. And, That's just a pop thing, though. I mean, I, I would assume artists well, have been it's, doing it's that. It's sort of bled into the rock and roll as well. You know, it, it's made its way. Um, 
rock and roll doesn't necessarily dominate the charts right now, and I'm wondering yeah. if it is because the the production technique has has sucked a lot of the life out of that give and take that we were talking about in the previous podcast, that push and pull that songs naturally have. That you could you could have stopped that sentence with the word suck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and, and like and like you were saying, Rich, it's not like this. We're here to bash the current industry. No, it's just it's this, shifted. This, this, the quality of musicians has been great since Greek times, when there was no money in music, mm. um, up to the current day and on into the next century. It's what is done with that music that's changed primarily, right. and w when it's become such a uh, uh, thing of commercial value um, that the commerciality of it has overtaken the heart and soul of much music. <clears throat> there are still great musicians, yeah. there always will yeah. be. Uh, yeah. um, like I tell, tell the guys that I work with, have fun, you know, go out there and you know, play your heart out. And yeah. That, that's what music's about. That's what Ross Robinson was about on these corn albums, was going in and being with the musicians as they were playing and being a part of the band and giving them that, you know, almost like a conductor of an orchestra uh, energy and boost as a sixth member of the band. Well, this, uh, going back to the second corn album, and it sounds like the recording process was very similar, um, one thing um, that uh, a, a lot of people might not realize is that these were um, major label releases so that when, when Corn goes into the studio, the label is picking up the tab, and then, of course, they take that out from, from record sales. And record companies are no longer doing what they call artist development. Yeah, that's, right. that's where I was going with it, and that's, done, that's the sad thing. That's all done at home on, on, on a computer, yeah. sitting in a living room, and the, the record company uh, therefore for doesn't get the benefit of the um, artist uh, development that they used to have. Now, it costs them a lot of money, of course, because of the artists they developed, only a few of them would actually make it. Right. But they got unique <laughs> combinations of things to happen that don't happen in a living room without somebody directing yeah. them. Yeah, I mean, that you know, Justin Bieber was a YouTube yeah. discovery. He was not it, it, developed. Is, is this a good thing or a bad thing? I don't know. Well, I, it's just, I it. think, yeah, I think it, good music comes across regardless of, you know, the medium, how it's recorded, and whether it has development or not. Because, I mean, if say if I'm a guy who writes some really poppy songs in my living room and has some good hooks and some good grooves and everything, and then... I send it to one of the labels who's like 10 feet away here in Burbank, you know, go and talk to some guy or have a friend, you know, and then it gets picked up. I mean, it's, st it's, st it's still getting through. I mean, yeah, well, one of my favorite quotes has been a good recording of a bad song mm -hmm. will never outsell a bad recording of a good, of a good song. <laughs> yeah. Oh. So, it, it, it's really, it comes right down to the music as to, to what people really want to hear. The great recording techniques, all the advances in recording technology um, are great if you have a great song to record, if you have a great band to record, if you have some inspirational material with an enthusiastic performance. Yes. That's when great technology comes together with great music to produce memorable songs. Another thing that, that Korn did on this second album, which I don't think was present on the first album, is they, they did covers. Yeah. Um, they did yes. Lowrider by War. Mm -hmm. um, oh, it, I, you know, it's interesting. I had done a number of albums with War um, credited uh, over the years, um, and, and both War and War with Eric Burden and Eric Burden with the animals and Eric Burden <laughs> without the animals. Yeah. That uh, for Corn to pick Sorry. a war song, um, I thought was just absolutely incredible. Yeah. yeah. 
my past history. No, and it's a good cover of it as well. It's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. One thing about a cover, and that was some. This is something that I think Ross really brought to the table as a producer. Is you don't do a cover unless you're got something that's as good or better than the original. I agree. Can't just be a cover. I agree. And bands that do cover songs that are like B sides mm -hmm. have missed the point of doing a cover. Well, you also have to make Ross it your own. Ross made Bring sure that the cover was something unique and as good or better than the original. Right. Bring hmm. your own spice to it. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Make it your own. Yeah. Own it. Um, Own it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, uh, Derek, again, this was two years later. Uh, we talked about in the first album. We started with you and your impression of it. What was your? What are your thoughts on this second record? You know, the second record, like I said, the the tour was what really stood up for me. The second, the second record, I liked not as much as the first one. Obviously, this one was more of their crossover album. You know, they brought in Ice Cube, and there, it had a hip hop kind of feel to it, which is a little different, especially back then of what I was into you know I'm a, I'm a kid from the suburbs in Florida like it's a little bit different nowadays the kids who listen to Eminem in the suburbs you know um, right. if, if anything you know that's that's the best way I could explain it but this album introduced us to the infamous um, the Cookie Monster voice which was basically Jonathan Davis doing Twist and um, mm -hmm. I never really considered it. Growling on yeah. I never really considered it the Cookie Monster voice, but over the years I've heard other people say it, and I thought, you know, that's kind of funny because I could. Battleship Mike and a, and a, a homemade distortion devices to give that extra uh, texture mm -hmm. to the voice. Um, Speaking of distortion devices, last time we showed you a low wattage. All too vintage. I think that amp was what from the fifties, Richard. Oh, uh, and dates are early fifties. And uh, we've also got a couple of other pieces of gear we want to show you from the session. This a was a bits. common device used on just about all of you know. This is a guitar pedal. It's an original MXR script logo distortion plus, and this was our secret weapon on vocal. This coupled with the battleship mic is the main ingredient of those distorted vocals. I've seen that battleship mic. Can you explain a little bit more what you mean by Actually, battleship mic? Actually, you're speaking into the battleship right now. <laughs> I know, I am. I wanted it. Because it ended up being the great <clears throat> mic with your voice mm. for this podcast. Right, exactly. Well, what do, you, what do you mean battleship mic? Tell the viewers what it is. It's what. a mic that was taken off the deck of a battleship near the gunnery section they had to have a mic that would withstand enormous sound pressure level without breaking and those mics became were made by rca they had huge capsules metal capsules not uh, plastic capsules and they would withstand that enormous sound pressure level of somebody screaming into it a gun going off close in close proximity. A cannon going off. Like literally, yeah. <laughs> you know, so, guns shoot bullets, you know, bigger around than your leg. So you right. wouldn't have a ribbon mic around, basically. Gotcha. No. <laughs> it, it, these were very tough, big brass monster heavy mics. I mean, a, a mic that weighs probably close to five pounds. Is Stevens using it now? Yeah. Can, Steven, can you it lift it up into frame so everybody can see what you're doing here? Uh, yeah, give me a second. Hold on, everybody. <laughs> He's like, let me muster the strength to move this monster into frame. Sorry to mess it up. I'm just interested. Oh, geez. Behold the quote-unquote battleship mic. Oh, wow. Let me show you the... So everybody can read that label. Uh, I don't know if they'll be able to read it, but... Details not too good. Yeah. Can you read? Not on these webcams. This is okay. a mic that was often used. Even um, you'll see it in the background of conversations with presidents. Oh, nice. Because they would have really good, high-quality mics. And you know, the president would speak, and there'd be like 18 mics in front of them. But during the 50s and 60s, 
there would always be one of these battleship mics there so that no matter what he did, it wouldn't distort. Be that they could count on having that one mic be the one that be used for those spots where every other mic distorted. Uh, Richard, between the first and the second Corn album, can you remember anything that was significant working with them? I We already discussed how they came back. They came the first time in a broke-down car, and they came back the second time with BMWs, but uh, more or less. But um, is there anything you can remember um, professionally or spiritually with them, like something that they might have... Um... There was a lot of tension going on in the band um, by then. There, there had always been a lot of tension, which is part of what leads to great performances and things like mm -hmm. that. But there was more tension, I think, on the second album than on the first album okay. amongst band members. You think that's the result of success? Oh, man. Probably. There were points where there were arguments amongst certain characters, um, and there were girlfriend... Uh, dun, dun, dun. Yeah, that's the one. And, uh, and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, this was just the natural evolution. Sure. Well, I, I read a quote uh, somewhere that, that one of the band members had said in the first record that that was the most focused they'd ever been. And were Indeed, ever, it was. And that they were ever <laughs> going to be. In other words, you know, this, was, this was said many years later in, in, in subsequent albums that they just didn't have the focus that they did on the first record. When you were there, did, did they have, quote-unquote, like entourage of people showing up, a lot of people hanging out in the, the, the right. guest rooms? and. No, I was just thinking about that. We, on a weekly basis, um, I pride myself on being a barbecue master. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we had two big smoker barbecues, and every week we would have what Ross would refer to as a river party, <laughs> where we completely destroyed the neighbor. Even though we were on 60 acres, it, you wouldn't think you'd be able to even disturb the neighbors. But when 150 people pour into a recording wow. studio and I barbecue for them and, and people are staying there all night and uh, you've got 16 people sleeping in a, in a guest cabin that's meant for five, um, wow. I, we, we had some enormous, what were called river parties, mm. um, <clears throat> although there was a little stream flowing between our place and Axl Rose's place, <laughs> not a river. I gotta say, but that sounds awesome, because I've been in many, many studios as a musician, and I've been in some right. pretty decent studios overnight. But that sounds awesome. I've never barbecued or had like 150 in people there. In fact, working... We had a playback party for, I think it was for the second album, for the Life is Peachy album, and there must have been 250 people there. Oh my there. gosh. And they, were, they were swarming me at the barbecue, and it would have to be like, get back, get back, you know? <laughs> Slapping hands. <laughs> the, I... And I also remember... Um, one of the guys in the band, we had grown some hot peppers. Oh, no. Tomatoes, peppers, and stuff like that. But we had grown some severely hot peppers. And I barbecued a few of them. And one of the guys in the band said, oh, I can stand anything. And he <laughs> took a bite out of the pepper, and he ran screaming to the bathroom. <laughs> Unfortunately, he still had part of the pepper on his hand as he went to urinate. Oh. Ouch. Oh, dear. And, and what bad turned to worse. Studio stories. Yeah. Man. Yeah. Ouch. War stories. Oh, my gosh. Ouch. Ouch. Yeah. I bet, um, I bet it was fun, let's though. Go in, let's go into... Um, we talked about kind of how the records were made. Were made. Um, both of these records were recorded on the Angus console? Everything ever done at Indigo was recorded on the Angus console. We had virtually every modules from every kind of console made, API, Neve, Trident, uh, Helios, uh, Quad 8, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Universal Audio. Universal Audio. Audio. Yeah, my favorite. Um, and those modules would occasionally be used here and there for various things, but the Angus console was the heart, soul, and basic recording 
tool used on virtually every track. Uh, another thing that happened in the 90s, and it was particular with Nine Inch Nails, was heavy, heavy compression. That's these days, um, too. <laughs> yeah, it, it hasn't really disappeared, but, but a lot of the... It's become uh, mainstream. One, one of the pieces of equipment is a distressor, uh, in case the viewers don't know what that is, that's a high ratio compression unit. Um, what about compression on these corn records? Oh, uh, there was compression. Well, are we you talking know? severe? Are we talking moderate? Are we talking... Um, I think the ends justify the means. Okay. Um, in the old days, and by old days I mean the 30s, compressor was the only special effect that an engineer had. Mm. And it was truly used as a special effect. By the time it got to the 90s, the compressor was used on virtually every recording ever made, if not during the recording process, during the mixing process, and if not there, then during the mastering process. Mm -hmm. On the corn album, compressors were used extensively on drums, vocals. Mm -hmm. um, for vocals, we had a standard Indigo setup which consisted of the Universal Audio 176, the tube version of the 1176 <clears throat> compressor. And we would hit it so hard, the needle would literally bury itself. But you, the 176 was that type of compressor where you could do that without distorting. All it would do is just make the signal such that nothing ever went past the level that you could safely bu wise record mm. and uh, that coupled with a variety of mics depending upon the vocal effect that you wanted be it clean or dirty and or the guitar pedals that were stuck in the chain along with the dirty mic uh, yielded all those many recorded sounds that you hear on the album did you it's not one mic you know one hand length away from the the vocalist, there were many different techniques used. Right. So would you did you use a lot of uh, reamping then, or was this kind of a you know? We very rarely reamped anything. Yeah, I was gonna say. If we kept it on tape the way we wanted. It was done again. We had on tape what we actually wanted. Basically, we we didn't record things and then uh, leave it to mix down day to get the sound we wanted. Well, so, 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 many, so many digital the units these days make it so easily, you know, easily available. I have an 11 rack in my studio, and a lot of times you just reamp one signal five, six times trying to find the perfect mix or whatever, trying to find what you're looking for with the song. So it's become so convenient. It's just, yeah. it's, it's crazy. Yeah. In the days of analog recording, we tried to get the sound the first time. for each um, to, you know, and we spend a lot of time getting tones, well, that's what, that's tones why. and textures <laughs> and uh, levels that were what we wanted to see when it came mix down day. That, that's what we were talking about, time in the studio being expensive, and now with things like re mm -hmm. it doesn't take hours of positioning mics and getting a tone. Now, when it came to positioning mics, we were very fastidious about that. Right. The, the guitars especially, um, we would have the guitarist in the control room hitting a chord, um, usually an, uh, a, a heavy open, <laughs> uh, heavy metal type of low-end chord, and then we would move the mic around with a guy in headphones being told, now oh, move it an inch to the left, now move it, uh, straighten it out, change the angle slightly, until we were hearing through the speakers what we wanted on tape. And you uh, you talked about using the uh, national amp, that was with an SM57. What about on the bigger amps? What mics did you use? On the bigger amps, there was usually three mics. Ribbon. And those three mics would, oftentimes, there would be a, a Royer oh, ribbon. Okay. Actually, we, we had a a B and O, Bang and Olufsen, uh, made by Royer ribbon mic that was uh, very, very often 
one of the main guitar mics. The other mics that were commonly used on guitar cabinets were the standard SM57, probably the cheapest mic in your in your box. Great guitar tone. Magical, yeah. And then a third mic would often be uh, a Sennheiser 421 mm -hmm. or an RE, uh, Electro Voice RE20 or a uh, AKG 452 with a 20 dB pad. <coughs> and maybe like something like a, a Neumann position further back? A Neumann oftentimes could be further back from right. the mic as a distant mic. But in heavy metal stuff, more often than not, you use the close did, mic. Did you ever have any clients that requested certain mics because they felt like because so-and-so before them like used, used one in the studio, then they must use that mic? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's not just okay. and same same with with you know we'd have clients that would kind of come in. I was like, oh, an Angus console. Well, we we need a Neve module for the guitar, so I pull out my box of Neve module <laughs> and yeah. compare it with the sound coming out of the Angus module. Box up the Neve module, put them back in the storeroom again, and then record it through the Angus. So a lot of. Well, so this we is what this is how I heard it was done, and then they actually hear the difference. Oh, I like the way it's cracked. Most of the time, now there were times of, uh, you know, that we did use the modules, or we did use a quad eight module. We had probably thirty different kinds of mic pre's to choose from, varying from really early tube mic pre's all the way up to the fanciest of the Dean Jensen stuff. Yeah, and uh, Dean Jensen was my in-house tech for the first few years. He basically built the guest house that the musicians lived in <laughs> for future years for himself when he would come up and spend a week or a weekend working on the Indigo equipment. Mm. Yep, Jensen Transformers. Jensen Transformers. People, people will be familiar with those. He didn't like to let people know that he even knew how to solder because he wanted to be thought of as the you know, the technical genius, uh, but he was probably one of the most amazing real-time find it and fix mm -hmm. it, make it all work together techs ever. Nice. And we were fortunate to have <coughs> guys mm -hmm. that he trained, Bart Johnson, um, to be our, our, our next in-house tech where all of Dean's uh, level matching and transformer uh, experience was transferred on to somebody who worked at Indigo. Let me let me ask you a timeline question. Um, so you you know starting off with the Moody Blues and, and working with artists like Neil Young, and then when you finished up at Indigo, you were in the new metal. So some of your last bands were. Including Slipknot. How did you? Corn, Slipknot, Limp Biscuit, Sepultura, Amen, that kind of stuff. Machine how did you? Machine. How did you feel over the progress of time, like going from artists like Neil Young to going to the new metal scene? Um, how did you feel music? Um, I thought it was really amazing for a while until all the new metal bands were trying to sound like Corn. Yeah. Or some variation on that and then it's that started getting old yeah. i finally retired and then got dragged out of retirement <laughs> to produce 150 previously unreleased bing crosby oh, well. songs from that, 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 right. uh, Steve, Stephen and i first technically worked on with that tape machine that you see in the corner of the picture behind him Studer. um that little scooter and uh we uh brought back to life Bing Crosby songs that had never been heard. Now, those were bands. It was one take. The band members actually played the song, and they basically positioned themselves at various distances the from mic, the mic yeah. so that the loudest instrument was the furthest the away. Drums. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and they did all that live in the radio studio. You know, it wasn't even... In that... And that's available to purchase now? 
Yeah. Uh, it was released as a box set. Um, I think it sold out. Perhaps they're going to re release more of it. Be, but yeah, it sold out. It yeah. sold out yeah, pretty yeah. quickly. And it got a good write-up in, uh, I think, uh, Wall Street Journal. Yeah, somebody people told said me. it was the best sound in music they'd ever heard from that era. Yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, um, going back to that whole, that whole, as you were talking about, Derek, the whole new metal sound, um, Korn really did kick that whole genre off. I think they're, they're credited as that. And um, like you were saying, Derek, I think maybe even in this podcast or another podcast, it's still kind of, you know, there's still odors of it or hints of it still around today. And, and as we talked about, it's 20 years on. Um, and, and Korn's put out um, different material from different kind of genres. Yes. Um, and, and I think some of it's really good, actually. Yeah, yeah, um, oh, yeah. But, but I can imagine that they, that they have a, a fierce fan base that's always hearkening back to wanting to hear the first kind of two albums that sound again because um, you know there was another thing I wanted to talk about and we talked about in the first record there's no real playing to a click and yet as, as you mentioned Derek there's like more of a hip hop feel to the second yeah. album and as to you Richard was there more of a click involved or was it again just all three four? There was always clicks in the studio. It's a question of whether they were used. Sometimes they would perform once with the click, and then they'd try and perform it on their own. Mm -hmm. And you'd have to uh, have somebody like Ross Robinson, as an experienced producer, choose what felt the best. Mm -hmm. And my personal opinion was, the click rarely felt the best. Yeah. Because it was, you know, there's a feel to music. Right, and once and once you lose the swing a lot of times, it loses its, its you know, its passion. It really does. I mean, if songs had to be done to a grid, we would never have heard of groups <laughs> yeah. that were the classic rock and roll groups. Yeah. There would be no famous songs by the Stones or Dylan or, or you know any of the early huge hit bands uh, because they weren't performed to a grid. They were performed by the way they felt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Especially when you go back to the days of blues bands and, and things like that. Um, the drummer wasn't counted on to be a metronome. He was counted on to make the song swing. Right. <laughs> well, I, I think the drum machine had a huge part in that. Because um, originally, drum machines were meant to uh, imitate a live drummer, and they never could quite pull it off. And then all of a sudden, you kind of hear live drummers wanting to imitate a drum machine. Um, and, and, it, and it's not genre specific. It's that idea of perfection. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, um, people's opinions of perfection got to be where it meant playing on a grid mm -hmm. rather than feeling good. And I, I think that was a step backwards, but that's just my opinion. Like we said, this podcast is more opinion than fact. Yeah. Well, and you mentioned in the previous podcast what the grid is, and I'll just remind the, the listeners and viewers, the grid is what is uh, used in uh, digital recording technology on um, mostly Pro Tools, but all the recording softwares do it, where you set the BPM, and then the drummer plays to a click, and if the drummer misses a beat or a slightly before or after, it misses the grid point, and the audio engineer or even the Pro Tools editor can then go in and push that beat Put to it a back. physically yep. exact yep, spot, and that's what he means by on the grid. It's commonly used today. It's... Um, uh, used just about on everything, although we even mentioned it as well, that there are some bands that are just refusing to be put on the grid, and, which is, a, right. I think, a nice thing. It'll bring some that and push and pull. And bands that are going back to recording analog. Yes. Yeah, yeah, there are. Yes. Well, one of the technologies that I've seen, and I know that um, I know that Aerosmith used it on, on their, their newest record, was that all of the mic inputs are put through a tape machine, literally, that is in co continuous mm -hmm. loop, and then that, all those signals are then routed to Pro Tools. So it's literally going through um, a tape machine because you can get um, a certain feel from tape that, that maybe people yeah. from the digital age would understand. You can push your levels on audio tape without it distorting. And it's 
it's a nice effect and it's been used on many records where in digital as soon as you push it to the point where it distorts you get what is called digital distortion and it's almost intolerable to hear right but you know you got to look at it from you you have two you have two main perceptions of audio quality okay you got the standard consumer that just wants right. to hear it and they want it now right. Right? right and then you have audiophiles like us people that were raised the people that were raised to hear one thing and can actually sit down and hear a difference and go, this is why I like this for this reason, this is why I like this for this reason. But to be honest, yeah. to most every consumer, everybody, they don't care. I mean, they just want to get no, it No, they want... They just yeah, want you're it right. Now. They want their 2,000 songs on their iPhone right. or their iPod. And what people don't realize is that even when you, when you have to get a song to that compressed level so that it can be a file that small you have to sacrifice quality. yeah and a really you know and people like i don't I, I, it's better than me having to carry around you know you tape play or whatever and, and i get it it's give me convenience and um but but as engineers we're just we're here to kind of explain that process of what happens to a track mm -hmm. when it ends up on an ipod it is it is changed yeah. you know yeah. and, and, and it's not even a complaint engineer will tell you even a six-year-old kid will tell you which one sounds better. Oh, yeah. yeah. If you play them back sound, side by side on studio monitors in a real studio and you play something off an iPad and then you spin the two-inch tape or a uh, half-inch tape and it's like, <clears throat> just, I mean, the difference is astounding. Right. But what people finally conceded to was the fact that everything, didn't matter how you recorded it or what you did, it was going to end up on a 44.1K 16-bit yep. CD. Yep. Mm -hmm. That was your final end product. Mm -hmm. And that's when people gave up on the analog superiority and said, well, what's the difference? It's all going to end up there anyway. Might as well record it digitally. It's so much easier. There's so many tricks that you can do. And then the war was lost. Richard, yeah. Richard do you remember the first record you purchased? The first record yeah, I purchased. The very first record. Yeah, it was Julie London. Julie London. Uh, <laughs> a, a, sing, a singer from the fifties, and I mainly liked her picture. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Stephen? Uh, I or think for CD me, it might have. No, no, I I was still around when records were the main. Um, I think it would have been um, Kiss Destroyer Kiss from the seventies. And um, that was a Bob Ezrin production. And um, as a young child, you know, I mean, I was fascinated by their image, and and, um, uh, and that was a, that was considered to be one of their best records. Um, but that was, I purchased that on vinyl, totally. Dang. Okay. Yeah. I had a collection of thousands of vinyl records. Yeah, yeah, I did too. I not thousands, but I had a I had a master collection. Of, um, and of course, even if if the younger audience doesn't know there were cassettes and, and eight track tapes so it, it was the, the thing that happened um everybody talks about the sort of the demise of the music industry yeah, and, in I, and, and, and i wrote an article about it and um what basically happened was with vinyl to cassette which was the first sort of copying medium mm -hmm. you had what's called a generation loss oh yeah generational loss it, of course <laughs> And, and so the record industry and the tape industry that made the, the cassettes, they weren't really that upset about it because they knew you weren't going to get the original quality of the record or the original quality of the cassette if you bought it as a cassette. When digital came out, that's a digital file. And copying mm -hmm. that hundreds of times, there is no generation loss. Right. You know, I got a uh, right. survey from the powers at the top of the record business, I believe it was in the 80s, asking, they saw the digital age coming, mm -hmm. and they said, what's the minimum, you know, you, you've been hand-selected as a, one of a group of engineers and producers to uh, give us your opinion. What's the minimum quality that you'd expect? Oh, no. And the various boxes that you could check, the top quality was 20 hertz to 20,000 because they knew that's what digital would give them. Right, it's capable of Whereas when you're listening to a tape machine, an analog tape machine, you're hearing well into the 30s. Hmm. 
Now, most people don't think they can hear anything at that frequency, but when you take that frequency away, you notice it missing. The spatial relationships go away. The, uh, the placement in the band, the, the tiny bits of, uh, of echo and mm -hmm. reverb and stuff like that, that was so important while we were mixing those songs from the 70s and 80s, the detailing was just gone when they went to, to it. And what the record companies really were doing is they were setting the stage with this survey to come out with CDs. What they didn't know is that they were shooting themselves in the foot because they thought that nobody would ever be able to copy a CD. <laughs> that, uh, oh, yeah, right, buddy. In order, I, I remember... Uh, one of the record executives saying to me personally, why, in order to do that, you'd have to have a laser. A class two laser. <laughs> yeah. and, and everybody does. And yeah. oh, well, two years that? later, right. every four-year-old kid with a computer had a solid-state laser mm -hmm. in his optical drive that would make perfect transfers of a CD. And all of a sudden... The idea of piracy and copying was down the drain. There was no generation loss. There was absolutely no dis difference between the original store-bought copy and the copy that I could make by the hundreds on right. my home computer. Yeah, it's a digital you file. Know, I, I think I saw you in a uh, in a documentary recently, Sound City. Didn't I see? You? Didn't oh, I see you? Uh, I, yeah. I was. I had a momentary right with camp. Ross Robinson. Yeah, the the reason I brought it up is because I was I was watching it and they were they were talking about being ushered into the digital age, you know, mm -hmm. and it really really got you thinking. And then of course that's a great movie, by the way. That's um, a great documentary. Dave and, Grohl did it, and I and I did a, a number of records at Sound City when Indigo was so booked that I couldn't get into my own studio. Oh, right. that's cool. And huh. I rented a lot of equipment to Sound City for bands that normally would record at Indigo that ended up having to go to Sound City because they couldn't get into Indigo. So you use that board that Dave Grohl purchased? Like, like, yeah. Good equipment. Yeah. Um, and, and that's where, you know, the, the, the Neve console and the, the Studer tape machine was king. Well, it, Derek, um, we, we talked about in the previous podcast for different generations. I was was uh, an engineer that was trained on tape, two-inch tape and, and all, and how to had to edit on tape and put songs together by purely by tape, no digital. Mm -hmm. And you being the youngest, were you introduced to engineering or production by a tape, or was it purely in the digital realm? Well, I started um, I started recording at studios around the southeast when I was about fifteen, and I spent a lot of time in the studios around you, know, Florida, Georgia, Alabama area. So I was always watching everything. So and it was it was pretty much always analog, although um, I didn't get my hands on analog too much. You know, I was more just like hanging out and watching stuff. But um, that's what actually led me to go to Full Sail because I wanted to learn more about digital, more about um, Pro Tools, things like that. You know, at the time it was all it was all um, studios in a box, those little ones, and I would sit. I would. Uh, like like the whole Zoom. like like twelve faders yeah. and a little uh, yeah. produce a CD at the end. Yeah, of the yeah. End yeah it was just yeah. it was like you know it was it was a quick way to do it. I had a band, so I would just set up at our band house, boom, mm -hmm. make all our little recordings, then I just export them out because I didn't I wasn't cool enough to have a CD drive built in, <laughs> so I would just export <laughs> them out, you know, to my computer or whatever, and boom, we had a little. You know, we had just a little demo of our newest song and stuff. But, yeah, definitely was around the analog, didn't get to touch it much. Right. And I think that's still important for bands today to be able to do that, to have a demo reel for playing in clubs or a demo of a song um, to play for a producer who's going to record them even in a big studio. Because mm -hmm. um, a producer sees right through the flaws sure. and the imbalances and stuff like that, and can can see when there's a a song that's worth exploiting. Mm -hmm. Right. So Maybe potential. exploiting's not the right but, word. Yeah. But producing. Producing. Sure. Yeah. Producing. Yeah. Totally. Um, 
we are a little over an hour, so... Um, yeah, oh, I just wanted to say this, and then, because um, we, we kind of got off a little bit from the corn to, yeah. to production, which is great, too. Um, I will say my favorite song on Life is Peachy is the song lovingly entitled Ass Itch. That's right. It's not Adidas like most people. The, the one that made it to the radio it is a good song, but I would prefer Ass Itch. I said it again. Um, you guys got any favorites off that album? I know I gave you a a, a, a memento of the corn. That was from Life is Peachy, wasn't yes. it? Yes, yeah, I'm looking at it right now. That was yeah. Adidas. It was, it was yeah, the grease board. Adidas on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and uh, you certainly uh, were the, the right corn fan. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, <laughs> To end up with that piece of, uh, you know, nobody else in the world has a piece of memorabilia like you yeah, have. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Directly to the sessions. Yeah, it's it's something else. It's something that I will always enjoy. Of course, I won't be able to always show it for the for the uh, for the questionable um, words written on that board, stuff that uh, <laughs> stuff that makes me as a grown man blush. Um, but yeah, no, I'll always enjoy it. And I'll have it up at the studio. You know, my mom will never see it. <laughs> Just as a side side note on, on the production, what they did um, uh, when when <clears throat> Rich and I were doing DVDs, we, we were like, we should give you know Derek something for all of his extra efforts. And Richard had this grease board I found in the back of the, one of the closets, and it's basically they had broken down the song Adidas, and they were talking, and they had written out on the grease board the song structure and notes about the song. And it's direct. I mean, it, it, it's you know from the sessions. It, yeah. It's um, and it was and our guide. It you know, was the guide with, for with the track. With virtually every right. session we did, we had a grease board like that, and or um, some sort of storyboard that had every song listed, every part, every player. And uh, I, I was happy to see that go to you. Yes, thank you. Yeah. You know, it's um, it definitely it's it will be well loved for many years, um, uh, many years to come. It's got all the other track titles from that uh, few that doesn't look like it made it on the Life Is Peachy album, but and then it's um, littered with curse words. So, <laughs> yeah. all right, well, guys, I think we're about to yeah, we are. Right. I'll um, just finish up uh, by saying thanks everybody for listening. Again, you can follow us at um, www.youtubestudioathq.com. Also on the Studio oh, Rat channel nice. are um, some of the tutorials. Uh, instructional uh, videos but they're more being made so we're giving you a taste there also on Facebook at www.facebook.com forward slash what's, Studio Rat HQ what's address again? please we oh, your yeah www.facebook.com Studio Rat HQ okay, cool. forward slash Studio Rat HQ we welcome your comments we want to start a dialogue and if you have uh, questions for Richard or any of us um, we'd be happy to try and answer them and um, we're going to probably take a week off for the holidays. So we'll get about two shows between now and January, but we will be right back in January. And we're going to continue with the new metal genre, because as we talked about, a lot of records were produced. What do you, what do you guys want to do next? I, I think, you know, we were talking about albums like Corn was, was really important to you, Derek. Mm -hmm. and, but I was really blown away by the Slipknot album. I'd love to talk about that. Yeah, so. yeah. Don't get me wrong. That was an amazing album too. And yeah, I love that. And, uh, I, I have some great stories about those boys from um, Iowa. <laughs> okay, then. So perhaps if you're interested, um, we'll talk about the Slipknot record next. Probably in the new year, we might be able to get to it. Uh, we're trying our best to do this weekly, and um, we are. I, as I said previously, I'm honored to be able to do this with you, uh, Richard and Derek. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, vice versa. We're, we're just doing it for the fun of it and also to just kind of talk about the war stories. Richard has most of them, but um, uh, we are having a great time doing this. So we hope you come back and listen to us.